Uh, this morning I want to talk to you about the benefits of prayer. When is the last time you considered the many benefits of prayer? You know, when we think about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says that God our Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And near the top of our list, surely when we think about spiritual blessings, we would put prayer up there. You know, perhaps we would pray more than we do. Perhaps we would value prayer more than we do if we took the time to study the marvelous benefits of prayer. So this morning, this evening, I'm going to look at six points this morning, six points this evening, just as a way of reminder and maybe some things that we hadn't thought of or maybe hadn't thought of in a while uh, of the benefits of this great blessing a prayer. I invite you to take your Bibles to be open to Isaiah chapter 40. Appreciate the presence of each one. Of course, we have a number of ours out, some tr many traveling, some with sickness, but in my head I counted around 25 of our number that are gone. Um, but um, we have a, with that in consideration, we have a decent amount when I think about 25 of our, our own not being with us this morning for one reason or another. But one of the great benefits of prayer, just think about it, that you and I are able to communicate with our Creator. Just let that kind of meditate upon that incredible thought. Here in Isaiah chapter 40, notice what the prophet records for us, beginning in verse 28 of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. He says, have you, he asks, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He is described to us as the everlasting God. Uh, the creator, it says, of the end of the ends of the earth. When we think about the intrinsic qualities of deity of God, we speak of his omniscience, he's all-knowing, we speak of his power, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. We speak of how his spirit is everywhere, he's omnipresent. And then you think about and consider that's who we're praying to. We're praying to the everlasting, eternal God, the one who's the creator of the ends of the earth, the one who's all-powerful, he's all-knowing. His presence is everywhere. His understanding is searchable. He, he never faints. He's never weary like we are. He's not. But this is the God to whom we pray. The God of Abraham, we're studying about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, Right? That's what our classes on Sunday morning have been focused on, upstairs and downstairs. The God of Moses, the God of David is the same God that we pray to. The God that they pray to and the God that they served is the same God that we lift up our prayers to. In Luke chapter 12, notice something that our Lord said here, if you will please. Luke chapter 12 and verses 6 and 7. He asked the question in Luke 12, verse 6, verse 6, beginning, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? Are not, and not one of them is forgotten before God, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore you are more value than many sparrows. That's one of those intriguing passages. Well, many are, but this is just intriguing when you think about these birds and talks about how little bit of money and you, you purchase just five little sparrows. But, 
but not one of them is forgotten. Another passage talks about one falls to the ground and God knows that. So if God has that much concern, that much knowledge about even a bird, what about you? What about me who have been made in his image? The one who's set over as the crown of his creation, who is given an eternal soul to he, he, our Creator, our Heavenly Father, who knows us inside out, who values us so much, who cares about us, who loves us abundantly. And so one of the great benefits of prayer, who we're praying to, we're able to communicate with our Creator, our Heavenly Father, our everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. Another benefit of prayer as we think about it is that, well, God hears us. God hears the petitions that we make. From our scripture reading this morning with Jude, 1 Peter chapter 3, the last part of our reading, remember what was said there. 1 Peter 3 verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on who? They're on the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers, it says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. His ears are what? His ears are open, ready to receive, attentive to what you have to say, to what I have to say. Notice his ears are open to who though? To the righteous. Those who are striving to live righteously according to his will, to practice righteousness. There's a passage there in the book of Proverbs that reads in Proverbs 28 and verse 9 that one who turns his ear from hearing the law, that even his prayer is an abomination. You know, we have passages like that, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, that remind us that God doesn't just hear anyone and everyone's prayer. We began the lesson with one of the great spiritual blessings for children of God is prayer. Right? That every spiritual blessing is in Christ Jesus. Well, many are not in Christ Jesus. And what a shame it is that, that I and perhaps you do not take it near enough advantage of this great spiritual blessing like we ought to, especially when we begin to think about the benefits, who we're praying to, what He can do for us, how well He knows us, how much He cares about us, and that when we pray, it's not like I'm praying to this wall. No, I'm praying to my God, your God, and He hears us. As long as we're, we're, we're being righteous and striving to live righteous lives, our prayers are not an abomination to Him. He, he receives them. He hears them. You remember the man who was born blind in John chapter 9? And he's brought before the, the Jewish rulers. And they're kind of going at him, but he, he's not just taking it. He's pushing back at them. And, and he says to them in John chapter 9 and verse 31, Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, he hears Him. And you know that statement that he makes really lines up well with Old Testament and New Testament Scripture about whose prayers God, God hears and whose He does not. Those who are a worshiper of God, true worshipers, those who do His will are what? Are going to be righteous. God's ears are open to the 1 Peter 3, 12. His ears are open to those who are righteous. Notice with me in 1 John chapter 5, if you will, please. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. We read there, and if we know that He hears us, you see that expectation and confidence, not a boastfulness, but, and if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. Now, I got there too late. I jumped in there. I'm sorry. Verse 14 it speaks of the confidence. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And then verse 15, and if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. We know that He hears us. We have this confidence in Him that He hears us. There's a few scriptures, just quickly I want to highlight 
from the Old Testament about just a reminder, if God was hearing the prayers and petitions of Old Testament saints, and, and then now we have Christ, who has come and now is the mediator, the intercessor, our advocate. And that hadn't happened back there, but God was hearing their prayers. Should we not even have more confidence because of Christ's role that God is hearing our prayers, that we can have confidence in that? But in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 3, and you don't have to turn to these. If you want to, you can. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. I don't have them up on the, up on the screen. But I'm just going to be kind of hitting these rather quickly. But 1 Kings 9, verse 3, this is Solomon's reign, building the temple. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, Another text very similar to that is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now there's a couple of occasions I want to notice with Hezekiah. Again, we're talking about at that time Solomon's righteous, he's godly, he's faithful. God hears his prayers. Hezekiah, one of those few good kings of Judah, after the kingdom splits, right? And so in 2 Kings 19 and verse 20, 2 Kings 19 verse 20, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Then in the next chapter, 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 5, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Of course, this is when he was told he was going to die, set your house in order. But he didn't just accept that and say, okay, this is it. No, he prayed. He poured out his heart to God. He wept. And God says, I've heard you. Your prayer, Hezekiah. Think about Manasseh. That's the son of Hezekiah. And when I read about Manasseh in the Bible, this is what I come away with. And, and maybe you have a, a different conclusion. But I, I don't read of any king that seems to be as wicked as he was. Whose corruption and depravity and evil, Israel, Judah, or he's even spoken of as being worse than the other kings, the Gentile kings, the Canaanite kings. He offered his own sons as burnt sacrifices. He had filled, the text says, he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. The Bible says that God's people never recovered from what this man did. And I say all that to say when God took him away with hooks by the Assyrians, as a captive, as punishment for his wickedness and the nation's rebellion, he humbled himself greatly, 2 Chronicles 33, and, and prayed to God. Is God going to hear a man like this? He did. 2 Chronicles 33, verse 13, and he prayed to him, and God received his entreaty, heard his supplication. And brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then, then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. He should have already known that. He should have already known that from his father being Hezekiah. He should have already known that being a king of Judah. But he knew that for sure after God heard my prayer and he restored me. Now, now think about this. If you don't have a lot of confidence for whatever reason that God doesn't hear your prayer. If he's here in Manasseh. In receiving his entreaty, he's going to receive ours when we humble ourselves, when we're striving to do his will and be righteous. He's going to hear our prayers. Of course, there's a number in the Psalms. Let me highlight some of those real quick with David. Psalm 3, verse 4. David said, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. 
Psalm 6, verse 9, the Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer, he says. Psalm 28, verse 6. Psalm 28, verse 6. Blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplications. Psalm 31, verse 22. Again, Psalm 31, verse 22. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you have heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. And then Psalm 66. Psalm 66 in verse 19. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Psalm 116 verse 1. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. The psalmist says I love the Lord. Why? Because he's heard my prayers. He's received my supplication. And then finally Psalm 120 verse 1. Psalm 120 verse 1. In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and He heard me. I want us to have the confidence that the Apostle John says we ought to have the confidence that God hears our prayers. If He heard Old Testament saints, if He heard Manasseh, He hears our prayers, He hears our supplications, He hears our entreaties to Him. We can have confidence in that. Another benefit of prayer is that it aligns our will with His will, which, of course, is always a good thing, right? And if we're praying as we ought to be, then prayer will align our will with His will. We're already, while we're here in 1 John 5, 14, <coughs> excuse me, and yes, I'm still trying to get through this mess, even though it's better than it was a week ago. <coughs> But 1 John 5, 14, we read it just a moment ago. But remember, John said, now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we what? If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. There's the, <coughs> excuse me, there's the stipulation that if, if we ask anything according to what? According to his will, he hears us. You know, Jesus in Matthew 6, when in the Sermon on the Mount, he said in this, this manner, therefore pray. He taught his disciples to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. James, when he's writing about prayer in James chapter 4, he says, you, you, don't, you don't receive it, you ask, but you don't receive it because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Well, that's not expressing a prayer or making requests to God that aligns with His will. You're not receiving it because you're asking amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures, on your own desires. But you say, well, how do I know if I'm praying according to His will. It's rather, I think it's rather easy to know. Here's His will. We know what pleases Him. We know what displeases Him. We know His ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. We know that those who turn their ear away from the law, their prayers are an abomination. We have a really good idea. Not just idea, we can know the more we read, the more we study. Here's His will. And we always want to align our will, our desires, and what we're, what we're doing, the direction we're going with, with His perfect will. But our prayers need to be in alignment with that will. And when it is, when our prayers are in alignment with His will, not contrary to His will, then again we can have this confidence that He hears us. Right? But that is certainly is a benefit because we always want to align our will with His perfect will. And prayer helps us to do that, doesn't it? If we're praying as we ought to, Another benefit of prayer, then, is it fosters a deeper reliance upon God. It, fo it fosters within us. That word foster, sometimes we, we hear the foster child. Like my sister and her husband, Clint Rachel Dean, who live in North Carolina, they, 
they brought in a baby into their home a few years ago uh, as a foster child. Well, finally, uh, just a little bit earlier this year, finally were able to adopt her into the family. And so sometimes we hear that term foster with a foster child, adopting a child. Just the word foster itself means to encourage or promote the development of something, and typically we're talking about something regarded as good, and this is definitely good. When we're praying, and the more we pray, it helps within us to foster a deeper dependence, reliance upon God, that, and, and that we need Him, and we do, for everything, right? Notice in Psalm 18, maybe you're already there because the scripture is in front of you. Let me join you here quickly. Psalm 18, and let's read verses 1 uh, through 6. Another psalm of David, the sweet psalmist. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I, tr I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me. and The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surround me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. and My cry came before him, even to his ears. You look at all those descriptive terms that David uses to describe God. And, and reasons why he should love him and why we should love God. You're my strength. You're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my deliverer. Again, he says, you're my strength in whom I will trust. You're my shield. You're the, the horn of my salvation. You're my stronghold. Right? That's a lot of different ways to describe what God means and what he is to David. And because of that, I'm going to call upon you. You're worthy to be praised. And, and David talks about how bad, how terrible things got in his life to the point that he feels like he's facing death. The pangs of death surrounded me, right? Floods of ungodliness made me afraid, he says. The sorrows of Sheol. Sheol is what? Sheol is the realm of departed spirits. Again, we're talking about death and dying. When he says that in verse 5, snares of death, they confronted me. So in my distress, what does David do? He turns to God. He turns to prayer. I cried out to you, he said, and you heard my cry became before him, even to his ears. And so when we remember just who God is and what he should mean to us, like he meant to David of old, and when we're going through difficulties in life and distress, we need to pray more. You need to always be praying, especially in those times. And it's a good thing for us. Again, it fosters a, within us a deeper reliance and dependence upon, upon God. Prayer helps build up stronger faith, deeper faith and devotion in God. So when I'm praying less, there's less reliance. And that is never going to be good for us uh, in life, period. And especially when we're going through difficult times, I need to lean in even more into prayer, right? And so another great benefit of prayer, maybe in close connection with what we just said, but mercy and grace in times of need. So look at Hebrews chapter 4 with me, if you will. Hebrews chapter 4. And let's read together verses 14 through 16 of Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great 
high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So think about what we just read. Think about these truths. Consider what our Heavenly Father has graciously and lovingly provided His children. He's provided us with this great high priest, Jesus Christ, who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. And the loving Savior is our mediator. He is our intercessor every single time that we say a prayer. Think about that. Every time we've said a prayer this morning, every time you say a prayer at home or with your family or wherever you are, think about Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, is there as our intercessor, speaking on behalf, representing us to God. He's our advocate to the Father, the Bible says. In fact, Hebrews 7.25 says, He lives to make intercession for the saints. Wow. What an honor and blessing that is. I mean... That's how much it means to him. How much does it mean to us? But every single time I pray, I have him. You have him. Our sympathizing high priest. This is why the Christian is encouraged, Hebrews 4, 16, to therefore come what? Boldly before the throne of grace. And don't you love the way the throne of God is described as a throne of grace? Come boldly to his throne of grace that we may what? Obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And just think of all the circumstances and times in our life where we need his mercy and we need his grace. Always, right? But especially maybe in times of sickness, in times of loss, death, a troubled marriage, wayward children, financial struggles, discouragement, the pressures of life, etc. This is what God makes available to you and me. And are we taking advantage of that mercy and grace to help in times of need? What a wonderful benefit of prayer. And then for the sixth and final point this morning, let me end with this benefit of prayer, that God is able to do far above what we ask or even think. So in Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to back up to verse 14, because here's a prayer that Paul includes in his letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 3, verse 14, beginning, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, in depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20 now, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, including ours, by the way, forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a remarkable passage? Isn't that a remarkable verse, verse 20? As Paul the Apostle says to the church in Ephesus and to us today, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think according to the power that works in us. 
I wonder what power works in us. According to the power, according to the power that works. A lot of that's what? A lot of that, it's going to depend on us. According to the power that works in us. What power? I thought he was all, he has all the power. He does. But if we don't ask in faith, he who does not ask in faith, but with doubting, James says, he's not, don't let that man think he's going to receive anything from the Lord, right? He's a double-minded man. So I think part of that power that works in us, we got, we got this faith and confidence, right? We come boldly before the throne of God. We, 1 John 5, 14, we have this confidence that he hears us. We're, we're, we're living righteously. We're, we're humble and reverent. But if we're meeting the conditions, and we're not really hitting all those this morning, that's not our focus, but if we're hitting the conditions of acceptable prayer, then have we even begun to touch the hem of the garment of, of prayer? I mean, think back to our first point, who we're praying to. Our Creator, the everlasting God, the eternal God, right? Right? the creator of the ends of the earth, the one who's all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present. That's the one we're praying to. With God, all things are possible, not impossible, right? But we need to let this Bible truth about prayer sink into our hearts and minds and be in awe and praise and thanksgiving for what He's made available to us through the spiritual blessing of prayer. And so as we extend the Lord's invitation this morning, I want, to, I want you to think about something. Does, does God presently hear your prayers? Does he hear your prayers? The, the man who had been formerly blind that Jesus healed, he said in John 9, 31, Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. So I say, well, he heard Cornelius' prayers, and he wasn't yet a Christian. Yeah, and, that, and that's been, I've had those discussions through the years with various brethren. Cornelius was one who feared God with all his household. And... He was described as a just man who gave alms generously to the poor. He was seeking, he was seeking God in his life. He wasn't living in a rebellion to God, and he just hadn't had the gospel shared with him. So he's not out here, knows God's will, he's not doing it, right? I remember something that stuck and hit me hard when I was uh, a teenager and I hadn't yet obeyed the gospel. And my mother came to my bedroom one night because I always, I still said my prayers, even though I, had, I was putting off obeying the gospel, but she said, does, does he hear your prayers? Well, I knew his will, and I hadn't acted upon it. I wasn't doing it, but boy, that hit me hard. God hears the prayers of the righteous, and it's one of those great spiritual blessings that is in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. Are you in Christ Jesus yet? Christ wants you to be, God wants you to be, we want you to be. If you have not yet obeyed the gospel, why not do that yet this morning? Be obedient to Him, believe in Him that He is the Christ, the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll have all spiritual blessings in Christ, including the one we spoke about this morning, prayer. If you are a child of God, there's sin in your life, then confess that sin, repent of it, turn away from it, turn back to God. God will hear your confession and hear and receive your repentance. We'll pray with you and for you. But if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, let that be known, please, as we stand and as we sing.